in plenary event, um, what is political party for the left. Um, to begin, we're going to follow the same uh, format rules as the opening plenary. Uh, so there will be 12 minutes for each speaker to give prepared comments. Uh, after that, we're going to allow uh, two to three minutes for brief responses by each panelist uh, to the other panelists. And then we will go to the audience for the question and answer session. Okay. Um, so starting from the extreme end of the table, on down uh, closest to me, we have uh, Chris Catrone. Uh, Chris teaches art history, theory and criticism, and visual and critical studies at the School of the Art Institution. Oh, sorry. School of the Art Institute of Chicago and Social Sciences at the University of Chicago, where he completed his PhD on Adorno's Marxism. He's the original organizer and president of the Platypus Affiliated Society. Uh, next is Mike McNair. Uh, Mike McNair teaches law and legal history at the University of Oxford. He's co-author with Jamie Guff, Go, yeah, Guff uh, of the misleadingly titled Gay Liberation in the 80s, uh, and is the author of Revolutionary Strategy, and of various articles on legal, historical, and political topics. Recent examples include Carl Kautsky and the Myth of Manchesterism, uh, the introduction to Ben Lewis and Maciejewski. I'm asking you for all the pronunciations here. Uh, their translation of Carl Kautsky and colonialism, and uh, De Glocke or the inversion of theory, from anti-imperialism to pro-Germanism. Uh, he's a regular writer for the Weekly Worker newspaper. Uh, then. Third is Adolf Reed, Jr. Uh, Adolf is professor of political science at the University of Pennsylvania. He's the editor of Race, Politics, and Culture, Critical Essays on the Radicalism of the 1960s, and Without Justice for All, The New Liberalism and Our Retreat from Racial Equality, and is the author of The Jesse Jackson Phenomenon, The Crisis of Purpose in Afro-American Politics, W.E.B. Du Bois and American Political Thought, Babyism and the Color Line, Stirrings in the Jug, Black American Politics, and the Press Segregation Era, and Class Notes, a collection of his popular political writing, uh, and so this is undramatical, but he is also the co-author of the Women in Black Intellectual History. He's been a columnist in The Progressive and The Village Voice, including frequently in the nation. Uh, he served on the board of Public Citizen Incorporated and was a member of the Interim National Council of the Labor Party and the Executive Committee of the American Association of University Professors. Finally, uh, immediately to my right is Tom Riley. Uh, Tom became an active new leftist in 1969. In uh, 1973, he joined the Spartacist League, and for the past three decades, he's been with the International Bolshevik Tendency and has long served on the editorial board in 1917. Okay, so before we get started, I'm going to read the event description, and then we will start uh, on the far end with Chris and move him this way uh, in order. So, <clears throat> In spite of many differing political currents and tendencies, the most significant question informing the left today is the issue of political party. Various left unity initiatives have been taking place in the aftermath of the 2008 economic crisis and subsequent downturn following Occupy Wall Street in the Arab Spring, alongside continuing post-political tendencies inherited from the 1980s to 90s, perspectives such as expressed by Hart and Nagri's empire, multitude and commonwealth, John Holloway's Change the World Without Taking Power, The Invisible Committee's The Coming Insurrection, The California Student Protesters Communicate from an Absent Future, The Formation of Syriza in Greece, and the new party Podemos in Spain rejecting the organized Marxist left, as well as the established labor unions as part of the existing political caste. In Germany, Die Linke appears posed to break into high political office. At the same time, there has been a growing crisis of the largest orthodox Marxists Trotskyist political organizations in the Anglophone and West European countries, which has been characterized as the crisis of actually existing Leninism in the developed capitalist countries. New publications have emerged, such as Jacobin Magazine, N Plus One, and Endnotes Journals, as a new millennial Marxism. And there has emerged a related discussion of the legacy of Marxism and principles of political organization going back to the Second International's. Uh, or sorry, the Second International from 1889 to 1914, neo kautskyism For instance, in Lars Lee's revisionist history of Lenin and Bolshevism, and the Communist Party of Great Britain member Mike McNair's book, Revolutionary Strategy, the latter occasioned by the formations of the Respect Party in the UK and the Nouveau Parti Anticapitalist in France. Today, perhaps the most significant question facing the left internationally is the issue of political party raising a question that goes all the way back to Marx's dispute with the anarchists in the First International. 
what would it mean for the left to take political action today? Today, the issue of political parties seems to generate more problems for the left than it solves. Formalized political organization would appear indispensable for a long-term viewpoint beyond the ebb and flow of movements. Yet the role of the party in sustaining activity and discontents over time, of building towards a revolution, has had at best an ambivalent legacy, leading as much to rationalizing politically ineffective strategies or giving cover for various forms of opportunism, for instance, reformism, careerism, and so on. Today, the idea of political parties is a means for the left through which the necessity for social transformation could be developed within society, as opposed to an end in itself, is difficult to envision both theoretically and practically. Yet the growing default, politics without parties, seems equally unable to do more than give license to the ebbs and flows through which capitalism changes but invariably persists. There appears no escape from the question of political party for the left. And so the end, Chris. Okay, thanks. Um, the title of the opening remarks that I'm going to give is uh, Marx, the Dictatorship of the Proletariat, and State Capitalism. In a letter of March 5th, 1852, Marx wrote to Joseph Weidemeyer that his only original contribution had been recognizing the necessity of the dictatorship of the proletariat. Bourgeois thought, Marx wrote, had already recognized the existence and the struggle of classes. Indeed, the existence and, and, and the struggle of classes, the struggle of the workers against the capitalists, had been recognized by bourgeois thought in terms of liberalism. Recognition of the class struggle was an achievement of liberal thought and politics. Marx thought that socialists had fallen below the threshold of liberalism in avoiding the necessity of both the separation of classes in capitalism and the necessity of the class struggle resulting from that division of society. Socialists blamed the capitalists rather than recognizing that they were not the cause, but rather the effect of the self-contradiction of society in capitalism. So Marx went both beyond the contemporary liberal and socialist thought in his recognition of the historical necessity of the dictatorship of the proletariat revealed by capitalism. Marx wrote the letter in the wake of the coup d'etat of Louis Bonaparte and his establishment of the Second Empire. It was the culmination of Marx's writings on the 1848 revolution and its aftermath. Weidemeyer was Marx's editor and publisher for the book, The 18th Brumaire of Louis Bonaparte. Later, in his writings on the Paris Commune and the Civil War in France, Marx summarized the history of Louis Bonaparte's Second Empire in terms of its being the dialectical inverse of the Commune, and wrote that the Commune demonstrated the dictatorship of the proletariat in action. How so? Marx's perspective on the post-1848 on post Bonapartism was a dialectical conception with respect to the necessity of the dictatorship of the proletariat that Bonapartism itself expressed. This was why it was so important for Marx to characterize Louis Bonaparte's success as both petty bourgeois and lumpen proletarian, as a phenomenon of the reconstitution of capitalism after its crisis of the 1840s. Bonaparte's success was actually the failure of politics, and politics for Marx was a matter of the necessity of the class struggle and of the, uh, the, the class struggle of the workers against the capitalists. Bonapartism was for Marx a dictatorship of the bourgeoisie, but not in the sense of the rule of the capitalists, but rather in terms of the political necessity of the state. Continuing to organize capitalism on a bourgeois basis and the imperative for doing so after the capitalists have lost the ability to lead through civil society. After all, as Marx put it in the 18th Brumaire, in Bonaparte's coup, quote, bourgeois fanatics for order were shot down on their balconies in the name of order. It was a dictatorship of the bourgeoisie in the sense that it did for them what they could not. The crisis of bourgeois society and capitalism ran deep. Marx wrote that every demand of the simplest bourgeois financial reform, of the most ordinary liberalism, of the most formal republicanism, of the most insipid democracy, is simultaneously castigated as an attempt on society and stigmatized as socialism. It was in this sense that the Bonapartist police state emerging from the crisis was a travesty of bourgeois society. Why Louis Bonaparte was for Marx a farcical figure as opposed to his uncle Napoleon Bonaparte's tragedy in the course of the Great Revolution. Where Napoleon tried to uphold such bourgeois values, Louis Bonaparte and others who took their cue from him abjured them all. 
1848 was a parody of the bourgeois revolution and indeed undid it. <clears throat> the tragedy of 1848 was not of bourgeois society, but rather of proletarian socialism. Marx described the perplexity of contemporaries such as Victor Hugo, who considered Bonapartism a monstrous historical accident, and by contrast, Pierre-Joseph Proudhon, who apologized for it as some expression of historical necessity, even going so far as to flirt with Louis Bonaparte as a potential champion of the working class against the capitalists, a dynamic repeated by Ferdinand LaSalle in Germany with respect to Bismarck, earning Marx's excoriation. Marx offered a dialectical conception of Bonapartism. Frankfurt Institute for Social Research Director Mark, uh, Max Horkheimer, in his essay on the authoritarian state, was inspired by uh, Walter Benjamin's theses on the philosophy of history, uh, which a, a series of draft aphorisms and introductions to his unwritten arcades project, concerned with how the history of the 19th century had prefigured the 20th century, specifically how the aftermath of 1848 was repeating itself in the 1920s and 1930s, the aftermath of failed revolution from 1917 to 1919, how 20th century fascism was a repeat and continuation of 19th century Bonapartism. So was Stalinism, Horkheimer wrote, that the authoritarian state could not be disowned by the workers' movement or indeed separated from the democratic revolution more broadly. It could not be dissociated from Marx's dictatorship of the proletariat, but it could only be understood properly dialectically with respect to it. The authoritarian state was descended from the deep history of the bourgeois revolution, but realized only after 1848, uh, only in the crisis of bourgeois society and capitalism, which made the history of the bourgeois revolution appear in retrospect, rather, as the history of the authoritarian state. But what had happened in the meantime? In the 20th century, the problem of the Bonapartist or authoritarian state needed to be addressed with further specificity regarding the phenomenon of state capitalism. What Marx recognized in the necessity of the dictatorship of the proletariat was the same as that of state capitalism in Bonapartism. Hence, the history of Marxism after Marx is inseparable from the history of state capitalism, in which the issue of the dictatorship of the proletariat was inextricably bound up. Marx's legacy to subsequent Marxism in his critique of the Gotha program was largely ignored. The question is how the Lasallian Social Democratic Workers' Party that Marx's followers joined in Bismarckian Germany was a state capitalist party, and whether and how Marx's followers recognized that problem. Would the Workers' Party for Socialism lead, despite Marxist leadership, to state capitalism rather than to socialism? Was the political party for socialism just a form of Bonapartism? This is the problem that has beset the left ever since the crisis of proletarian socialism over a hundred years, years ago, in World War I and its aftermath. Indeed, socialism has seemed to be haunted by this historical verdict against it, as state capitalism, and so disqualified forever as a politics for emancipation. Marxism fell apart into mutual recriminations regarding its historical failure. Anarchists and council communists blamed Leninism, and Leninists returned the favor, blaming lack of adequate political organization and leadership for the grief of all spontaneous risings. Meanwhile, liberals and social democrats quietly accepted state capitalism as a fact, an unfortunate and regrettable necessity to be dispensed with whenever possible. But all these responses were in fact forms of political irresponsibility because they were all avoidance of a critical fact. Marx's prognosis of the di dictatorship of the proletariat still provoked pangs of conscience and troubling thoughts. What had Marx meant by it? We should be clear. State capitalism in the underdeveloped world was always a peripheral phenomenon. State capitalism in the core, developed capitalist countries, posed the contradiction of capitalism more acutely and in a politically sharpened manner. What was the political purpose of state capitalism in a post-proletarian society? rather than in backward, quote unquote, backward Russia or China and other countries undergoing a process of industrializing, proletarianizing. How did socialism point beyond capitalism? Organized capitalism relying on the state is a fact. The only question is the politics of it. Lenin, for one, was critically aware of state capitalism, even if he can be accused of having contributed to it. The question is not whether and how state capitalism contradicts socialism, but how to grasp that contradiction dialectically. A Marxist approach would try to grasp state capitalism as its Bonapartist state 
as a form of suspended revolution, indeed as a form of suspended class struggle. The struggle for socialism, or its absence, affects the character of capitalism. Certainly, it affects the politics of it. A note on neoliberalism. As with anything neo, it is crucially important to distinguish the neo from the thing. It is not the liberalism of the 18th or even the 19th century. It is a form of state capitalism, not an alternative to it. Only, it is a form of politically irresponsible state capitalism. That is why it recalls the Gilded Age of the late 19th and early 20th centuries, the era of imperialism, or of the imperial, that is, Bonapartist state. However, at that time, there was a growing and developing proletarian movement for socialism, or revolutionary social democracy led by Marxists, in nearly all the major capitalist countries, or so at least it seemed. Historical Marxism was bound up with the history of state capitalism, specifically as a phenomenon of politics after the crisis of 1873. For this reason, the history of capitalism is impacted by the absence of Marxism 100, 100 years later, after the crisis of 1973. After 1873, in the era of the Second Industrial Revolution, there was what Marxists once called the monopoly capitalism of global cartels and financialization, organized by a world system of states which Marxists regarded as the highest possible stage of capitalism. It was understood as necessarily bringing forth the workers' movement for socialism, which seemed borne out in practice. The history of the 1870s to the first decades of the 20th century demonstrated a growth of proletarian socialism alongside growing state capitalism. Rosa Luxemburg pointed out, against social democratic reformists who affirmed this workers' movement as already in the process of achieving socialism within capitalism, that, quote, the proletariat can only create political power and then transform Aufheben, capitalist property. That Aufheben, the dictatorship of the proletariat, would be the beginning, not the end, of the emancipatory transformation of society. As Michael Harrington noted, drawing upon Luxembourg and Marx, quote, political power is the unique essence of the socialist transformation. It is this political power that the left has avoided since the 1960s. In this country, the United States, the liberal democratic ideal of parliamentary, demo of, excuse me, Jeffersonian democracy, the idol of the American Revolution, was shattered by the crack of the slave whip and by the blast of the rifle shot to stop it. Jefferson's election in 1800, through which he established the political domination of his Democratic Republican Party, was called a revolution, and indeed it was. It defeated the previously dominant Federalists. What we now call the Democratic Party, beginning under Andrew Jackson, was a split and something quite different from Jefferson. The Republican Party, whose first elected president in 1860 was Abraham Lincoln, was a revolutionary party, and in fact sought to continue the betrayed revolution of Jefferson's Democratic Republicans, avowedly so. That's where they got their name from. It was shortened from Democratic Republican to Republican. It was the party of the last great political revolution in American politics, the Civil War and the Reconstruction under Ulysses S. Unconditional Surrender Grant that followed. Yeah, you gotta let that one. Its failures demonstrated, as the revolutions of 1848 had done in Europe, the limits of political and social revolution and capitalism. It showed the need for socialism. The last major crisis of US politics was in the 1960s, New Left challenged to the ruling Democratic Party's New Deal coalition that had been the political response to the 1930s Great Depression. But both fell below the standard of radical republicanism. It is something less than ironic that the Democrats have been the most acutely counter-revolutionary of Bonapartist parties. This despite John F. Kennedy's declaration in 1960 that the strife of the 20th century, expressed by the Cold War struggles of communism and decolonization, was an extension of the American Revolution to which the US needed to remain true. He said this when he was running for president in 1960. Yeah, the standard of politics has fallen a great deal since then. <laughs> The history of the state in the modern era is inextricable from the politics of revolution. The crisis of the state is always a crisis of political parties. Crises of political parties are always crises of the state. The crisis of the state and its politics is a phenomenon of the crisis of capitalism. The question of left and right is a matter of the degree of facilitation in addressing practically and consciously the problem of capitalism and the problem of capitalism is inextricable from the state. 
The notion of politics apart from the state and of politics apart from parties is a bourgeois fantasy, precisely a bourgeois fantasy, a fantasy of liberal democracy that capitalism has thrown into crisis and rendered obsolete and so impossible. Capitalism presents a new political necessity, as Marx and his best followers once recognized. Anarchism is truly liberalism in hysterics, in denying the necessity of politics, in denying the need for political party. In the absence of a left, politics and the state, that is capitalism, will be led by others. In the absence of meeting the political necessity of the dictatorship of the proletariat, we will have more or less hard or soft and more or less irresponsible capitalist state dictatorship. We will have political irresponsibility. To abandon the task of political party is to abandon the state, and to abandon the state is to abandon the revolution. It is to abandon the political necessity of socialism whose task capitalism presents. It is to abandon politics at all and leave the field to pseudo-politics, to political irresponsibility. The left has done this for more than a generation. What would it mean to do otherwise? Okay, next is Mike. Okay, I'm going to pose the party question uh, as one simpler, I think, than it tends to be posed. Uh, partly a question of doing away with certain encrustations of so-called Leninism, but also of rejecting in doing so uh, a, an interpretation of the role of party, which is a reinvention of Bakunin's invisible dictatorship. I start with the proposition, very, I know this is uh, abstract in general, the human being is a soul political. The human being is a political animal, an animal which lives in social groups, which forms social groups in relation to which disagreements and collective decision-making are natural, and the formation of groups, subgroups, groups within groups, and so on and so forth, are endemic, and not merely limited to capitalism. We, I give, just as a few examples, the sort of parties, the optimates and populares of the late Roman Republic, sort of parties, uh, in late antiquity, the conflicting groups of, uh, quote, barbarians, quote, bishops, uh, and secular bureaucrats like John Lydus, uh, overlaid with policy considerations, peace or war with the vandals, uh, Leo Bacalos and the death of Ardenbor and Patricius, this reflects a party-ish uh, group, factional struggle within a uh, late imperial regime, in late Anglo-Saxon England, cross-cutting issues of Wessex, Mercian or Northumbrian identification aligned, realigned with differences of policy choices, i.e. for the reconstitution of Canute's North Sea Empire of England and Scandinavia, i.e. for an English identification with uh, Francia and in particular with Normandy. So the, this sort of debate, difference, issues is perennial. A capitalist constitutionalist state order implies endemic political parties. Guelphs and Ghibellines in the 14th century Italian city-states. Remonstrance and counter-remonstrance in the 17th century Regents and Orangists in 17th century Netherlands, most clearly Whigs and Tories in England from later 17th century England onwards. <coughs> the underlying question, which is supposed, remains in this system of parties uh, that there are necessary common actions and what, there are necessarily disagreements about these necessary common actions. Capitalism and its ideologues, liberal ideologues, Whig ideologues, that variant of capitalist ideology, there are other variants, constantly imagine that you could have capitalism without the state. The, the reverse is in fact true. The uh, hidden hand imagined by Bernard Mandeville in uh, 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 the favour of the Beast doesn't work. The reality is capital, capitalist markets tend to fly to chaos and disorder and 
the more the market, the stronger, the more the civil society, the more strong the state has to be. <coughs> Hence, parties function as, among other things, a mechanism to integrate uh, the lower orders, in particular the petty bourgeoisie, behind the capitalist elites. But the party question, in spite of the fact that the party system is an institution of capitalism, of constitutionalist capitalism, <coughs> it's also an opening for the working class. The working class as a class requires collective action. It's the elementary feature of the working class, that the working class is not in possession of the means of production. It's in, is, is, it therefore needs collective action in order to defend its elementary interests. Illegalizing trade unions, prohibiting trade unions, is easy for capitalism, normal, goes back to the uh, Confederacies of Masons Act 1425 in England, and endless anti-trade union legislation of one sort or another. Illegalizing political parties <coughs> would force the regime uh, to abandon the constitutional form of the representations of uh, capitalist class fractions through political parties, the integration of petty bourgeoisie through political parties, and resolve it instead into the real Bonaparte form, which is the single person auctioneer of laws, con state contracts, policies. Yeah. Bonaparte. Marcos, CC, uh, the endless <coughs> examples, uh, Cromwell, of course, in, uh, going back into the 1650s. The consequence of that, therefore, is it's harder for the capitalist class to ban all, it's not possible practically for the capitalist class to ban all forms of collective action, at least to ban political parties. And the working class's need for collective action can find expression in political parties, even under conditions where trade unions are either banned or thoroughly subordinated to uh, the, the operations of the state. <coughs> Further, the question of general laws, this is just a piece of Marx, the class struggle of the proletariat of the bourgeoisie is conducted at a guerrilla level at the level of the economic struggle, uh, of the strike struggle. But when the proletariat fights for general laws to impose its interest, it fights to impose its political economy on the society as a whole. And another anniversary of our times, it's uh, <coughs> 800 years since Magna Carta 1215, Marx commented of the Ten Hour Day Act that this was a modest magna carta of uh, the rights of working men and the starting point of uh, uh, proletarian political economy. So the question of working class political action, the question of party is of the independent political party of the working class is foundational because it's a, the existence of political parties is a necessary contradiction within capitalist constitutionalism into which the working class as a class can enter and it, by entering into it, through which the working class as a class can uh, project its uh, uh, <coughs> own political interests. But that does require that we be for an independent working class political party. And that means not just a, or, but which is organisationally independent. The Labour Party in Britain is organisationally independent of the capitalist class. The capitalist class gives some money to the Labour Party, but it's basically funded by the trade unions. But it's not politically independent. Now, it's not politically independent because it precludes itself by its constitution from thinking beyond continued capitalist rule. It's not that the Labour Party, in order to be politically independent, would have to commit itself to Leninism, revolutionary overthrow, blah, 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 positively. It's that the Labour Party commits itself 
to the monarchy, the international state system, the United Nations, the uh, continued functioning of the dictatorship of the bourgeoisie. By committing itself to the internal continued functioning of the dictatorship of the bourgeoisie, it ceases to be independent of the capitalist class because by committing itself to the nation state, it commits itself in effect to a choice, devil's choice, between on the one hand autarky, which for Britain would mean mass starvation, just as for Greece, if Syriza went for what the pull out of Europe people say and go for a full autarky and rationing, Kostas Lapovitsas and Co. and SOAS, School of Oriental and African Studies proposed full autarky, uh, <laughs> introduction of rationaling, general nationalization of everything uh, for Greece. Greece has not been able to feed itself from internal resources since the 5th century BC. <laughs> um, and that policy of socialism in one country is uh, hopeless. The same is, of course, true of Britain. Britain has not been able to feed itself from internal sources since around 1800. Uh, <coughs> so that then your alternative is how do you make the nation states succeed in the capitalist competition of nation states? That you become uh, you, you enter into the agenda of uh, British competitiveness, American competitiveness, uh, and uh, 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 follow the uh, path down the road of uh, all the crap uh, comes back under this uh, supposedly left-wing, supposedly workers' government. I don't know what's going to happen in Greece. I, I have to say that it seems to me that the likelihood is disaster, whether it's the coup of some sort or of Syriza. Uh, if Syriza implements austerity under the Troika, nonetheless the Troika will, will still wish to starve Greece in order to show that what the price you pay for electing a left wing government is a catastrophe. So just finally, very finally, back to uh, last night's plenary, I'm a pragmatist at a certain level, I'm a pragmatist like Walter Ben Michaels and Toby Chow, yeah. but I think, don't think pragmatically that their pragmatism will work, <laughs> because Keynesianism, the welfare state, all of that stuff was the product of Soviet tanks on the L, and the product of the Russian Revolution, and the product, in fact, going back before it, of the mass social democratic parties before 1914-18, creating conditions in which the uh, capitalist class was afraid of bankers hanging from lampposts and of losing everything. And it's only by making the capitalist class afraid of losing everything that it is likely that they will make concessions on the scale of the concessions that they made in the post-war period. That is yet another reason why we need a political party which does not limit itself. I will not say which commits itself to revolution, but which does not commit itself to demanding nothing more than uh, a slightly larger slice of the cake. Yeah, I guess this is it. <clears throat> uh, well, I'm going to try, try not to get the orange light. It's frightening. Um, so I guess I should um, begin by um, apologizing a little bit. Because I'm, I'm just a small-minded kind of guy, and, um, or at least about this kind of stuff. And, and my compass was much narrower. And I feel like uh, I'm going to expose myself to you as a kid who rides a short bus uh, into school in the morning. Um, <laughs> Because um, I, I took this narrowly, or I mean, the way that I focused it was, uh, was quite specific to the contemporary U.S. Um, and it, it might sound a little odd for me to open with this declaration, given what I assume some of you know about my, uh, my political history. Uh, but um, I think the party question is 
a premature question for the left in the U.S. at, at this point. Boom. I could maybe stop there and just pass the microphone on. <laughs> but I'll say a little bit about why, and I might, um, along the way, wind up saying a couple of half informed, maybe three quarters informed, and kind of how you speculative things about some of the other um, parties in the Western Hemisphere that have uh, that, that have set themselves out in um, a critical stance vis-a-vis -vis at least neoliberalism and possibly capitalism. And I know that that's you know, also a, a matter of debate as to which, if, if either is the case with those other parties. But as a sentiment of uh, earlier panel today, uh, a beginning point for talking about questions like this in the US left is, or rather in the US, is the fact that there is simply no left that exists in the United States. There are leftists, obviously. We're an auditorium full of them. But, but if we think of a left political force as one that's capable, again, I'm sorry if anybody who's at the earlier panel and heard this, uh, we can hear it again. But if we think of an, um, a, a left as an entity that's capable of, of intervening in a political struggle to challenge uh, and even alter the terms of political debate, then there's no such force in American society and there hasn't been for almost as long as I can remember, uh, or um, at least for almost all of my adult life anyway. And what's happened instead, actually, is that for a variety of reasons, a lot of which have to do with, with uh, the redefinition of, or, or the shift in understanding of politics from, that, from, from an institutionally based uh, strategic activity to, to a more individual and expressive activity. Um, a redefinition of what counts as a left. Um, and, and somehow along the way, over the last 30 years, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm going to be quiet, there's not time to talk about it. Uh, but it's not somehow, it kind of, uh, I think the outlines about it happen fairly well, well known. Um, what people have come to think of as, as a left, to the extent that it's been disconnected from challenging um, Contradictions rooted in contradictions and inequalities rooted in the political economy, rooted in capitalist political economy, <clears throat> in in the U.S. has been re redefined as something else, right? Some, something else that has no popular base, doesn't seek to generate a popular base, uh, doesn't have 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 a strategic orientation. Part of the problem is a legacy of my cohort of leftists, right? I mean, the new left types of the '60s. Who somehow uh, and and uh, by the way, I want to underscore the point about uh, you know the successes of the '30s through post-war era being entirely contingent on on the Red Army basically and 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 the strong Soviet Union. There would have been no civil rights movement in the U.S. for for, for example, if that were the case. What weren't the case? There had been uh, no de decolonization in the so-called Third World or the Soviet Union. And there would have been no no no, no successful D-Day invasion, I mean, just to be a real jerk about it. <laughs> uh, but um, but somehow something happened, uh, and I think some of it may have had to do with with the atrophy of extramural political activity. And we could talk about what happened between 1945 and 1975 uh, in American politics. Um, to, to bring that, 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 that outcome about. But, um, but the atrophy of, of extramural left, left activity uh, and the migration of those of us um, who came out of the new left uh, into the universities and um, embrace of various, um, you know, left toy theoretical I mean, discourses that became in, increasingly disconnected from the working class and from working class based politics. The next thing you know, that uh, the notion of pursuit of power, uh, of, of class power and of state power as a project of the left, not only sort of fell off the table of consideration, but was positively and actively rejected. I can't tell you how many um, settings that I've been in in, 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 in the last decade or, or in um, more recent years, 
uh, when, where, where the general discussion of the need for, um, for a disciplined central political strategic in intelligence to guide uh, class struggle just gets hinted at. And the next thing you hear from, 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 from the academic left is, this, oh no, you can't be talking about a vanguard party. We can't have anything like that. Look how bad that turned out last time. To, to which I'd say, oh, uh, you know, compared to Bill Clinton, right? Um, <laughs> um, and from that perspective as, as well, I think that this offers us, to, all right, so Ashby to the left and builds on itself, right? We, we, uh, we, uh, we have a right wing that, that understands politics and also understands how to generate constituencies around like a social vision. And it's tougher for them in principle that, that than it is for us of the, uh, because their capacity to build something that, that, that looks like um, a winning alliance is, de is, is dependent on bullshitting people, right? Um, of, uh, they cannot construct um, a, a majoritarian alliance on the basis of their class program. Uh, I'm just thinking Rama, for instance. Uh, so it's the standard, uh, um, you know, the ages old technique of, of the scapegoating. That frankly looks cruder and cruder to me almost every day, and to which I'd say, again, look around. Um, but so, I mean, so here we are, right? Uh, we have no institutional capacity as, as a left. We, we uh, really have no, uh, uh, I mean, there's no space for, um, a working class based critique of the workings of American capitalism in American politics at, at, at this point. Um, and so from that perspective, I would argue, and look, I mean, I'm talking about, I mean, some of you know, uh, I spent more than 15 years of my life trying to build like an independent you know, I mean, political party anchored in a working class. And we made very clear from the very beginning that we were not trying to organize the left we we're not trying to build a left party. We we were trying to build a working class party that was anchored in the trade union. Um, and it may be useful for us to talk about some about what what happened with that experience. Uh, but um, you know, for now, um, conscious of the orange light, uh, I will say uh, for a shorthand uh, observation that our history with that experience is what has absolutely convinced me that the idea of, um, of a left party, a, um, a popular left, left party in, in, in the US is premature. So what we need to think about then in you know, this country is a project of building a left. And then we can talk about you know, what its institutional expressions should be like. I, you know, I'm inclined to think that at some point you've got to have have, you know, have a disciplined party, right? Uh, and and I mean the bourgeoisie, for its part, shares that view. In fact, they have two of them. Uh, but so, like, then the question becomes: Okay, well, how do we go about building the left and re rebuilding the left? And what what sort of issues? What, what kind of project? What sorts of alliances? That does it make sense for us to try to build? I mean, I, uh, you know, I think. It, it would be helpful for us, actually, to discuss in a kind of sober way, and by sober, I mean not the, you know, looking for the sellout, uh, the recent mayoral election here, right? Because this was one of those moments of, of intervention, right? Um, that, that, that was in, in a significant ways um, a, a, com uh, a complicated class project, but it was, but it contained within it uh, a working class based challenge to neoliberalism in the city of Chicago. And I want to make clear too what I mean by neoliberalism, because I think we have another tendency. I think this probably has to do with the extent to which professors are involved in in the left chatter, and also to which there's the internet, right, and the blogosphere. But we have tendencies to lapse into endless taxonomic exercises. You know, does this count as neoliberalism? Does that count, 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 as, count, as, count as neoliberalism? 
do they share an immediate lineal ancestor? But well, when I talk about neoliberalism, what I mean most fundamentally, most crucially at its heart, is capitalism that has effectively eliminated working class opposition. And I like to stress that perspective because another problem that we have in the US that militates, and um, I was gonna say even, I might even say especially, uh, you know, inside the trade union movement, a, a trope that um, consciously or not um, re represents that 30 year truce that we were able, that our side was able to extract from the bourgeoisie as a, a new nature, right? A, um, a new moral order. So, so much of our protests now and objections take, take, take the form of greedy capitalist bankers. Oh, I have to admit, like the image of bankers hanging from, from the lamppost just does, just does a body good. <laughs> um, um, you know, the, that these ruthless, greedy bankers and, uh, and the other capitalists, Walmart, big, ugly, terrible, nasty, are violating the social compact. And uh, 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 I mean, the social compact that somehow you became nature somewhere between uh, 1935 and 1946. And I think part of the project of building a left, and what building a left means given where we are, is that it's largely a cadre-based project of creating constituencies for the kind of political vision that I suspect everybody in this room come, 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 comes together with. And one of the ways we do that, yeah, of course, it's gotta be done in the context of establishing direct personal connections with people and, 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 and building standing over time and you know, everything else that organizers understand. But part of the project of political education is challenging the view and this will come from a lot of our left spoke or our progressive spokespeople, trade union leadership, whatever, ch ch challenging the view that that what we're seeing now, this neoliberal thing, is like um, a new <coughs> new um, departure from uh, the Keynesian consensus. What this is is capitalism, and this is what capitalism is, and. Um, and it's capitalism without, uh, you know, uh, in uh, which we aren't strong enough to force any concessions. And I think it's important for us as part of popular political education, which I think is the most, most important task for in the project of building the left, and it can't be done on the internet, um, is to find ways to get that that message out, and and, uh, and and by the way, it can't be done through corporate media either. And I, I think that's another tendency um, that people who understand themselves to be radicals or activists or, or leftists have fallen into. But right? this notion that we can take shortcuts, right? Like if we could get good coverage in the New York Times or on the MSNBC or on or on the NPR, PBS. I mean, um, over the entire history of the Labour Party experience. Some, some, some of our own militants complained. You know, we weren't trying to get, get ourselves projected into the media. And, and, and it's not the guy arms way. Uh, and we didn't because we understand that they work for the other side and there's no way that they would, would report on us fairly. So there are no shortcuts to this, right? Uh, the big demonstrations, uh, I mean, they don't build a movement through, through mobilizations. Um, but part of the project of doing the kind of organizing that, that we need to do ha has to involve making clear that what we're talking about is, is, is capitalism, what's causing uh, the pain and the insecurity among working people broadly understood is, is the natural logic of capitalism. Um, and after we've done that, you know, after we have some constituency, after we have some base, after we've you know, we had some fights, uh, then, 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 then it's time. For, then, then it could be time for us to talk about uh, building a party of the left in the U.S. But at this point, I think it's really uh, putting the cart way ahead of the horse. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, finally, Tom. Yeah. Um, well, I had a somewhat different approach. Uh, but there's a lot that uh, has been said that I would 
interfered. I think the, the question of what kind of party we should seek to build, and I'm presuming that we should be seeking to build from the title of the uh, forum, not, we don't have a consensus on that perhaps, but I think it very much depends on what objective we want to achieve, because different forms of political organization are appropriate to seeking different outcomes and different tasks. Now, we in the IBT take the view that the essential task facing humanity is the expropriation of the capitalist class on an international basis and the destruction of various um, military and security apparatuses that serve and protect those capitalist classes. Uh, it's not a feasible project to establish uh, socialism through persuasion or incremental reform because the capitalists are not going to cooperate in their own destruction. That's obvious. It's going to take a convulsive social revolution. Uh, and uh, this is a precondition for reconstructing a rationally planned, ec ecologically sustainable, equitable social system where those who labor rule. And that's what socialism should be. It hardly needs to be said that right now in the US and most of the rest of the imperialist country, we're, as Adolf was saying, a very, very long way from any sort of proletarian revolution or prospect of it. But that is the task for those who are serious about a socialist future. There's no alternative. We've got more than 200 years of experience to draw on, reaching back to Gracchus Babouf and Philippe Bonarati and their conspiracy vehicles in the 1790s. Um, there have been a lot of failed attempts to overcome capitalist hegemony, ranging from the putsches of the Blancas to the electrical electoral cretinism of social democracy and the popular frontist two-stage uh, strategy adopted by the Stalinized Communist International in the 1930s. Lenin sketches four key factors in a successful work of revolution uh, in the conclusion of his text, Left-Wing Communism. The first one is the ruling class confronted by a crisis it's unable to solve using its tradi traditional methods begins to polarize into different factions, pursuing different policies, um, which largely tends to par paralyze it. Secondly, the intermediate social layers between workers and capitals begin to lose confidence in the viability of the ruling regime. Thirdly, the working class begins to exhibit a combative attitude uh, and begins to look for solutions outside of its experience under capitalism and the framework of the established structures that it uh, has endured under capitalism. These factors were all present to a greater or lesser degree in the Paris 1968 events. What was missing was the fourth factor, which is the decisive one, of course, and that is the existence of a mass revolutionary workers' party with a tested and competent leadership. Leon Trotsky observed uh, in one of his writings in the run-up to the Nazi victory in Germany, the class taken by itself is only material for exploitation. The proletariat assumes an independent role only at that moment when from a social class in itself, it becomes a political class for itself. This cannot take place otherwise than through the medium of a party. The party is that historical organ by which, by means of which the class becomes class conscious. I think that that's self-evident. Marxists conceive of revolutionary organization on an international scale. The object has to be the creation of a single world party with national sections. The basis for such a party has to be a common political program, that is, a system of ideas that addresses the fundamental problems that confront humanity in general, and the working class in particular. One of Trotsky's favorite maxims was, it's not the party that makes the program, it's the program that makes the party. Now, of course, it's quite a bit easier to make a program than a party, but I think he had a point on the thing. Um, there's only one time in history, of course, that a revolutionary party has led the working class in a successful seizure of power. Uh, despite the fact that this occurred almost a century ago in a predominantly peasant country, the fundamental elements of the political organization and strategic orientation that made that success possible and distinguished the Bolsheviks from the mainstream social democrats of the Second International remain of vital significance for the future. It is our view that serious revolutionaries should model their activity on a Bolshevik success, 
rather than the repetitive failures of reformist gradualism, multi-class alliances, and the all-embracing formlessness of, of episodic new phenomena that appear on the scene like the new left or Occupy, and initially are seen as something completely different, but eventually turn out to be merely the square wheel reinvented. Leninism is not currently popular among most young people who don't like capitalism. Uh, which, well, that wasn't the case when Adolf and I and uh, Mike were young. Um, this is largely because, as well as being seen as old-fashioned, uh, it's also derided as authoritarian and hierarchical. As a system of <laughs> Leninism is indeed hierarchical. It involves layers of organization, layers of personal authority, a chains of command, and bodies that are empowered to issue instructions that are binding on lower bodies and on individual members. If you're in a Leninist organization, you don't get to just do what you feel like. That's, that's what discipline is. As for authoritarianism, of course, here's Frederick Engels' uh, famous observation in uh, his dispute with Kukunin that a revolution is certainly the most authoritarian thing there is. It is the act whereby one part of the population imposes its will upon the other by means of rifles, bayonets, and cannon. So yes, revolution is authoritarian. Leninism, to that extent, is authoritarian. Anybody that wants to get anything done is going to have to impose their will on those who are presently imposing their will on us. And if you don't like that, then you don't belong to a Leninist organization. <laughs> <laughs> but a Leninist organization is more than that. It's like a healthy worker state. It has to be characterized by feedback loops that give the rank and file the means to determine the policy, uh, the strategic direction that the organization is moving in, to change and adjust policies as situations develop, and if necessary, to replace leaders that are found to be deficient. That's that's indispensable, and without that, you don't have a Leninist organization, you have something that looks more like um, Bob Abakian's group uh, and many others. Um, any political movement that exists inevitably has a leadership. The question is, does it operate openly or secretly behind the scenes? That's your choice. A socialist movement must be serious. Uh, about not only challenging the ideological domination of the capitalist elites and their agents, but also developing the capacity to overcome the resistance of the existing state apparatus in order to carry out the expropriation of the ruling class. This requires what Lenin described uh, as the construction of a combat organization, the prototype of which, of course, 100 years ago in Russia, had sunk roots throughout the working class and also extended its reach into every level of society that it could possibly contact, including, in particularly, the ranks of the armed forces. When the opportunity presented itself in the midst of the crisis of World War I, the crisis that it presented for the Tsarist regime, the Bolsheviks successfully outmaneuvered the equivalent of the FBI and the Homeland Security services and apparatuses and put together a coalition with other radical formations, including particularly anarchists and social revolutionaries, uh, and successfully carried an insurrection that seized power for the working class and established a new state power. The October Revolution in 1917 was the greatest event in history. Ultimately, the revolutionaries were defeated, but they set a powerful example and they proceeded to actively organize parties embracing hundreds of thousands of workers, the sections of the Communist International. That was their highest priority. They had an internationalist perspective from the beginning, and they understood that their revolution could only succeed if it spread. The organizational model they developed during the first four congresses of the Communist International, that is when Trotsky and Lenin were in charge, not Stalin, is not a secret. In our view, it remains fundamentally valid in all important respects. The fact that we are a very long way from being able to create such parties does not make them any less necessary. And how does the political society stand in relation to this question? The sort of party needed today is, in my opinion, no different from what was needed 25 years ago, when Chris and, and others bounced off the degenerated former Trotsky Spartacus League. <laughs> I bounced off a few years earlier. <laughs> 
I was bounced out of it actually. <laughs> Perhaps that's what happened to you too. I, don't, I mean, I don't know the particulars of what transpired, but it's my impression, impression that Chris, at least, was wrong on the substantial programmatic difference he had with the ESL leadership. And that was the question of whether or not Marxists should militarily side with Saddam Hussein's loathsome regime against the attack of US and NATO and associated imperialist militaries. Of course we should. Of course, <laughs> revolutionaries should always side with neo-colonies that are being attacked by imperialists. That's a no brain. But Chris was young. He could think for himself. Perhaps he was already an incorrigible element. I don't know. But I do know that the SL, for at least a decade at that point, had a tendency to play hardball with any kind of internal dissident, whether from the left or the right. The group's leadership thought developed a plan that it would short circuit the necessary but time consuming process of having open political struggle because you lose people. It's easier to keep the group together and be successful if you just squash this stuff as it begins to develop. And, and the result is an organization which it, in the short term has greater efficiency and more flow, but in the long term it loses the capacity for internal discussion and debate. And that is a capacity that was, it's not an option, it was essential, and it was characteristic of Lenin's Bolshevik party throughout its life under his leadership. It was also characteristic of the left opposition under Trotsky. It was characteristic of uh, the SL, in fact, uh, in its pre-degenerate form. Um, by the late 1980s, however, the SL had hardened into what we call Jimstown, in which the leadership's logo was our party, love it or leave it. New recruits were still taught the formula about the importance of internal discussion and debate uh, in a Leninist organization, but in reality, there was very little space for thinking or uh, expressing any sorts of differences. Uh, and anybody who did and didn't abandon them very quickly was usually subjected to a vigorous internal campaign designed to either break them or drive them out of the organization. On the basis of his experience, Chris and his comrades apparently concluded that the SL's version of Leninism, which it sounded plausible enough when they joined, presumably, uh, had some deep flaw that needed to be transcended. Looking around, they perhaps and probably found the rest of the left was in one way or another just as bad. But in fact, the SL in this period was not a genuinely Leninist organization, and therefore, I think the founders of Platypus were fundamentally mistaken in their assessment of the Leninist Trotsky's tradition. To be fair, however, I have to say the classical society has continued to show some respect, at least in terms of the reading lists they distribute to elements of the tradition they rejected. Now, I'm not going to be able to get into the rest of my fascinating remarks, but I will just <laughs> conclude that while most people uh, in this room think that there's very little prospect of forming a viable left party in this country, uh, I'm sure that the, the consensus is that it's impossible to imagine recreating a mass Leninist international. And there's no question, this is an extremely remote prospect at this point in our history. But if we're serious about undertaking a struggle for fundamental social change, that is, we're getting rid of capitalism and replacing it by socialism, which, given our present circumstances, really amounts to a fight to save humanity from extinction, it surely makes sense to start from what is objectively necessary rather than from what seems to be achievable in the framework of the present circumstances we confront. Okay, now we're going to allow uh, two to three minutes for each panelist to respond to each other, uh, and then we'll open up the floor, or open up to the floor for questions. Uh, so in the same order as the comments from Chris to Tom, uh, two to three minutes of response. All right, I just have a few remarks to make with respect to my fellow panelists' comments. Um, so one is, uh, is actually not directed at, at my fellow panelists, but more a kind of uh, setting of terms with respect to the, to the audience. Uh, I think that it's always important to distinguish between politics and policy, and I think that's, that distinction is uh, very obscure to people nowadays. Um, I find, at least in talking to younger people in Platypus, uh, namely that uh, you know, policy refers only to what to do, 
uh, whereas politics must refer to who is going to do it. And that that's a, a sort of a major distinction, and that raises the question of the party. Um, in other words, who are you organizing to do what? Um, with respect to Mike's comments, uh, I wanted to say something, I wanted to point out uh, just some things uh, with respect to this category of working class political economy. And I'm sure that Mike, you disagree with me on this, um, with respect to the meaning of Marx's critique of political economy. In other words, is Marx elaborating a working class political economy, or was he in fact critiquing the working class's political economy that it inherited from classical bourgeois thought? I think the formulation that you came up with earlier was Proudhonianism and left Ricardianism. And what I would say is that uh, Marx tries to uh, overcome the antinomy of uh, a kind of what he called petty bourgeois socialism of Proudhon and a left Ricardianism and show that this expressed the dialectic of capitalism itself. I'd also point out that, uh, and I suppose this is a controversial formulation, Adam Smith as a liberal defended labor unions. In other words, he, he argued in the world of nations uh, about the necessity for the system that he was advocating, the necessity of collective uh, action on the part of, of the laborers. Um, and, and finally, I'd say antagonism is not the same thing as contradiction in, in Marx's sense. Um, with respect to Adolf, um, I wanted to uh, sort of raise the question, push a little bit on this question of building the left, how to build the left. Um, and uh, the question of it being premature uh, to have a party project. Um, I would say that uh, perhaps what's necessary is not a labor party, but a socialist party. In other words, that the banner of socialism needs to be raised as a goal, and that uh, a formulation that the revisionist historian Lars Lee is, has, has given to describe the Kautskyan party of the late 19th century is the union of socialism and the workers' movement. In other words, socialism as a bourgeois ideology, um, the union of that with the workers' movement, uh, and that in, in that respect, that uh, aspect, socialism, is precisely what has, what has collapsed, not only the workers' movement, but also socialism as a concept. Um, and, and, and to you know, sort of push on the question of the prematurity of political party with respect to how Marxism traditionally understood politics and the relationship between politics and, and capitalism. Namely, that for Marx, capitalism was class struggle. Right? That, that without class struggle, you don't really have capitalism. Um, and so what you have is what the Frankfurt School called brackets. Um, and uh, you know, what's interesting is that they formulated this concept of brackets in the period in which precisely FDR disciplined the capitalists. In other words, the disciplining of the capitalist class was the way in which capitalism was preserved. And yet, at that same moment, I'm not sure exactly what to make of this, that FDR disciplined the capitalist class as such, the Frankfurt Institute thinkers thought that it was appropriate to describe this as something other than traditional capitalism and rather as rackets. Um, finally, uh, I will say that to Tom, um, that, uh, well, maybe um, one little personal note, I didn't, there was no break between me and the Spartacist League over any political disagreement. I upheld their slogan about defending Iraq during the Gulf War. Um, it wasn't anything like that. It was actually my personal demoralization of two things that happened, uh, namely the LA riots and the election of Bill Clinton. Uh, basically told me, look, you know, there's not gonna be um, a, a socialist revolution anytime soon. And I would sort of push back on the issue of, of you know, whether we got, you know, me and Richard got uh, turned off to Leninist party politics forevermore. No, but I think that we were clear, as the Spartacists were clear in the way that they talked to us, that a propaganda group is not a party. And uh, the propaganda group is essentially a formation that is appropriate to a historical moment of splits and regroupments and that splits and regroupments is a historically conditioned phenomenon and that we haven't been living, even though people in the 70s, you know, Maoist Trotskyists, seemed to think you know, that it was a good moment for splits and regroupments for political constitution in that way, perhaps it wasn't. And that certainly subsequently in the 80s and 90s and up to the present, we haven't lived in an era of splits and regroupments and so therefore the propaganda group model has come up against limits. Mike? Um, <clears throat> Thank you.
on the, the question of possibilities, which uh, uh, both Adolf and Tom raised, uh, I think I, mean, I, I do think it's interesting in sense the series of Podemos uh, did uh, not so much, but uh, um, Rivondazioni when it was at its height in the 90s. Um, the right initiative in the right place at the right time it is possible to trigger a very rapid development. And of course, that's actually what happened with the um, Bolshevik Party. They unified a bunch of propaganda groups in 1901-03. Uh, and the fact that they were unified, they happened at the right time. Then when the revolution broke out in 1904, that began to transition to a minority mass party. Um, <coughs> And so that is, the question is, is it, are you going to do it? What can you, how shall I put this? In this sense, I have common ground with Tom in the sense that um, it has to be the case that what you're going to do is something which means something. Um, there's no use in, I like, what's being done all over in Britain and in quite extensively in Europe, is to try and rerun, to recreate uh, a social democratic party. <clears throat> yeah. And the problem is, there's already social democratic parties in the first place. In the second place, the social democratic parties have moved to the right. They haven't ceased to be social democratic parties in moving to the right. They've moved to the right because of the pressure of the world economy, of uh, US state globalization pushes them. Um, so you need to go for what's needed. You need to go for, yes, actual Bolsheviks. The problem with uh, the tradition of the RPT and of the Spartacus League and of the Trots in general is it's not actual Bolshevists. Actual Bolshevism yeah, is a party <laughs> in which, uh, well, A, just uh, is uh, actual Bolshevism is a party in which the question of what line in spring 1970 was fought out in the public press between the public press of the uh, uh, Central Committee and the public press of the Bible District of the Party. It's a party in which Lenin says to Zinoviev and Kamenev when they want to say, we're going to stop this uprising by exposing it in the mentally press, you have the right to defend it in the party, to oppose it in the party press, not in the, our opponent's press. Yeah. And that, the conception of uh, the, 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 <coughs> the problem, which is, you know, it's, it's not just the IBT. I was a member of the Vanderlight organization, which also had public debate, the most limited and controlled by and uh, internal debate conducted internally. The consequence of that is actually you're not educating the cadre and you're not educating the working class. Yeah. And Bolshevism is constantly, everything is in front of the class as a whole, as far as it's possible to do that under conditions of clandestinity. And uh, the, uh, that, <coughs> So we, we need to go for a party which is revolutionary in character, but a party which is revolutionary in character does not mean an invisible dictatorship, which is what essentially the Trotskyists and the Maoists and the far left in general have reinterpreted Bolshevism as an in, 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 invisible dictatorship. Okay, you know? um, Yeah, I mean, that's a couple of things. I guess, um, yeah, by what way of response, um, I guess one thing I should say, and not just a response, it's maybe uh, an addendum to the earlier intervention, is um, I should have mentioned in the bio that two of my other associations are um, on the editorial, uh, I mean, collective of Nonsite, which I'm quite proud of, and, and I'm on the editorial collective of the Socialist Register. And, and the reason I mention that is that uh, when I was last in Toronto, we had a nice discussion uh, very early and uh, preliminary about uh, the 2017 issue, which is going to be um, you know, devoted to how, to how we should think about the idea of re revolution now. Uh, and um, granted, we talked about it in Bella, so it's not like it was, you know, a, um, uh, uh, um, uh, a 
be deep and intense, but one of the issues for concern that, frankly, I was kind of pressed on is to, that, that I think we need to take extra special care to, um, within the tradition of Leninism, certainly, to, um, uh, to avoid the temptations of teleology, uh, which can often sort of slide close to theology. Uh, um, um, I was glancing at Spencer when this popped into my mind, because there's a convention in the Protestant South in the US, like in the summer. It took me a long time to figure out what it was. I go to places and see VBS, VBS, VBS all over, and it's vacation Bible school. I think we should try to keep the tendency to do to do BBS down, down a bit. Uh, I, I mean, that's so. So where I'm going with that actually is is this because this is the concrete context in which this came up in our discussion in uh, at Toronto. Which is how, um, Sarisa Podemos, Didi um, um, Linka, right? That we all understand discuss. But, but what's more vexing, I think, for a lot of people on the left is how to think about the ALBA countries and regimes like Venezuela, Brazil, Ecuador, Bolivia, uh, Uruguay, to some extent Argentina, it's more of a Peronist thing. Uh, and, and I've noticed that, that there's a tendency among elements of the Marxist left to uh, score those regimes savagely from the outset because they aren't committed, well, because they've made concessions to the realpolitik in, in those states and with the balances of class forces that are necessary for them to win and to hold power. Um, and I think that those states or, or, the, or the contradictions in which those regimes are enmeshed, and they are, and they are enmeshed, and there are multiple tendencies in, in, a, in a, every one of them, and the struggle is constantly on, ongoing. Um, and it's not clear how it's gonna turn out in, in, in any one of those states, but if we read it with a teleological roadmap, then there's no point doing it, right? Uh, um, uh, because what is most likely to happen and, and I will say that it's most likely to happen. I, I, I mean, I'll grant that it's most likely to happen. What's most likely to happen is, and I think we're seeing signs, signs of this in every one of those societies, that um, first, the, the, the bourgeois classes in each state thought that they could just denounce the governing re regime, giving the society over to the broke losers. Uh, but then in each case, by the second and third term, they figured out you can't really win a majority election that way, right? So th then they discover the corruption and they're getting, uh, you know, the CED money and, and all the rest of that to try to destabilize the regime and press for coup. But there's been enough of a change in Latin America that, um, that it's not quite so easy for, for, um, for, for um, Obama just to send the 82nd Airborne down there. And, and uh, to perpetrate the coup. All right, so why am I going on about this uh, with, with respect uh, I mean, to Latin America in response uh, I mean, to Chris's point? Well, it, it, um, the punchline is that the, the ways that we have to build a left in the US now have to take, yeah, I mean, I agree, right, that ultimately, uh, I mean, the point is to um, agitate for socialism. And nobody in this country knows what socialism means even. Right, so the first thing we have to do is like fight for stuff like uh, decommodified housing, right, or 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 um, expanding the domain of the decommodified public services, transportation, education. That uh, and and uh, not in that language, obviously, but in, in the terms that ordinary people understand, and then that gives us the foundation of common perspective, common interest gives us some interpretive standing that we can try to build on, and then at some point, uh, it becomes clear that that's what socialism is, and, and 
And then we, then we'll, we'll, when we have, as we have enough of a movement that emerges uh, in uh, support of an agenda like that, then organically, like a party uh, um, in the revolution, uh, a potentially re revolutionary mass party will will emerge. But but it can't be under um, presumption of the conditions of 1917 or 1949 or one that's very close to my heart in 1958. Uh, but because the conditions are entirely different. Uh, I mean, the character of state power, especially in the U.S., is entirely different. And the objective always has to be to find, a, um, and especially in a mass society of this sort, to find a way to unite the many to defeat the few. And, you know, that's, that's where the Socialist Party is going to come from. Uh, Tom? We're in embarrassment of riches. Um, Actual Bolshevism, uh, I, the reason I mentioned, or one reason I mentioned that the Bolshevik revolution had sought to internationalize itself and codified the uh, organizational model that it recommended in the first four congresses is because that's the organizational model that we recommend, and it's the organizational model that Mike uh, doesn't think is a very good idea. You don't support the organizational resolutions for common right? Um, so, you know, enough on that. Um, I think actually it's not a very good idea to encourage members to leak plans for an insurrection when uh, things hang in the balance. Mike thinks that's okay. I think it's okay to hide that from the workers, and uh, they won't want to participate if they don't want. But they, I don't want to be involved in an insurrection run by people who are prepared to print details about it in their paper in the Socialist Party's paper or wherever. I mean, that's just, to me, um, well, doesn't make sense. Uh, to Chris, well, you know, okay, I'm sorry, I uh, certainly didn't mean to falsify your personal history. I thought I, that that was a, a rough approximation. I knew I, there was a lot of details I was missing. That would be kind of a good story, but uh, <laughs> it would bring us closer in some ways. Um, however, uh, I think that you, uh, I think that basically I got the story right. That is that you joined the Spartans so you're going to one set of understandings and you came to a conclusion that that wasn't going to work, so you threw it out. Um, I think that you were wrong, and so I think I was right about that, too. And here's what I'd say about propaganda group perspective. Okay, well, maybe there's not going to be a revolution very soon. I have to admit that when I was very young, um, it was a widespread expectation in my circle of, you know, 5,000 people in SDS or whatever it was, there's going to be a revolution in five years. And uh, I no longer have that expectation. However, <laughs> I would say this, that uh, it's also, it's often very difficult to know what's around the corner. And sometimes things are much closer than you think. Personally, I wasn't, I was not really despairing at the LA riot. I just thought what an enormous amount of anger there is stored up in American society among the people who are suffering the most and yet, how it's can only you know it, 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 what a tragedy it is that this can't be tapped in some organized way, and it has to take this chaotic and, and uh, uh, nihilistic expression. That was my sense of it. Um, but I would recall for comrades that in January 1917, Lenin wrote a letter from Switzerland uh, back to Russia, in which he said. Well, looks like we of the older generation probably won't live to see a revolution because there's not much going on, is there? You know, it's sometimes, I mean, that's a famous example. But, you know, you can't know that, I mean, now we do know that 20 years after you left, there wasn't going to be a revolution in the United States. I would also say this, though, that a propaganda group uh, of the size of the Sparks League when you left it, in 1934, uh, the comrade last night who spoke about the building of the CIO, um, one thing you got a little wrong was that Flint was not really the kickoff. What was really important was 1934. The, after a whole series of defeats, there were three successful <coughs> general strikes, one in Toledo, one in Minneapolis, and one in San Francisco. What they all had in common was they were small groups of cadre formations that kicked them off. One was the Muskieite group, which was called the Workers' Party. One was the Trotskyist group, which was led by James B. Cannon. Both of them were smaller than Spartacus League was when, when uh, Chris and I belonged to it. And both of them, uh, you know, it was a context where the workers were prepared to struggle. We can't go out and make that happen today. But small groups of people can actually achieve significant things sometimes. 
Even our own small group, we were able, because of prior implantation that we inherited from the Sparsis League, to initiate a successful 11-day boycott of apartheid cargo uh, in the west coast of, of uh, the U.S. that Nelson Mandela hailed when he returned to the U.S. And we got letters from South African trade unions who were living underground praising us and saying how encouraging it had been and what a great thing this was. And that continued, that continued to resonate uh, through several years. In 2008, the same people, many of them who were involved in that, managed to organize a one day, only one day, shutdown of every port on the west coast of the United States to protest the war in Iraq. That happened because a very, very small group, like very small, had a little meeting around somebody's kitchen table and initially in 1984 planned that, made it happen, and there were pre-existing connections that you get from cadre formations and that don't exist otherwise. And that, in fact, kicked off the CIO in 1934. So it's entirely possible that a group of 200 people in the United States could make a huge difference, but they have to be willing to put up with authoritarianism and hierarchy in a democratic framework. <laughs> okay, we're going to go to the audience uh, now. Um, I'm going to ask one question and then allow panelists to respond at a time. Um, so, yes, Richard. Yeah, um, um, I, I guess uh, I wanted to highlight the differences in the question of what is the development. Tom is very explicit in what needs to be done, but overlapping is part of it. So I guess the question is for the, the other panelists to respond to that. I mean, Adolf seems to be saying, well, for the time being, we have to do is build a movement, and somehow the movement, at some future point, will become a party. And presumably, that means that some kind of mass, non-Leninist, sort of left social democratic party, like the Labour Party. I mean, I remember some tangential experience with the Labour Party in the 90s, and it seemed to be like all sectarians fighting with each other. It didn't seem Where? Like just in New York City. Oh, yeah, of course. <laughs> so, but I mean, so, so, and, uh, and, and I was the executioner that killed that fucking like chapter, too. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 then, and then Mike seems to be advocating, so whereas Tom looks to the third international, Mike seems to be looking back to the second international, which of course raises the question about, like, didn't that fail in 1914? And then Chris's response, uh, seems a bit knowing because like on the one hand um, in his talks, I mean uh, a kind of Leninist interpretation of history, which would in some ways be similar to Tom's, is upheld, but at the same time obviously we're not like trying to build a Leninist party or joining that. So that, that raises the question of like, like how one imagines if one does not like and, and I mean the other thing that, that's the irony Wrap it up, Richard. <laughs> well, well, I mean, again, it's like this question of small groups. I mean, for, so I, my personal political history isn't that important, but I remember when I first encountered people from the IBT in person. It was 1994 in New York City at a debate between the Sparks and uh, Sim and uh, and, and, yeah. and I remember talking to these IBT people about the Spartacus League, and some of them saying to me, "Well, we consider the Spartacus League reference." Right? And I remember having this like huge sense of, well, like either these people are crazy, because that doesn't make any sense to me. I'm sure that we didn't say that. Well, we have a disciplined <laughs> organization, and you're not allowed to say that. We <laughs> still don't <laughs> consider it to be reference. Okay, this, this isn't uh, wrapping it up for Okay, but this is Like at some level, then the question becomes like, like, if one can see them as reformists or centrist or whatever, one then, more sentence. Then the question would be like, like, how does one think about these tiny things? Okay. From Chris on down. Uh, you know, I push again back on the propaganda group model. Uh, obviously, you know, at various points in history, uh, various tendencies or organizations or even sort of small political parties. Uh, could be seen as playing a propaganda role. Um, but again, to get back to the issue of politics, like what one actually means by politics, meaning uh, you know, 
who is going to do what and who those people are, you know, so the issue of the contracts. Um, the question is, how would you develop uh, long-term militant cadres today? Um, and you know, on what basis? And who, who would these people be? And you know, what would they do? And what is the long-term goal? Um, I mean, obviously part of what the premise of Platypus is in terms of us being ecumenical in these conversations is the idea that uh, each of the perspectives of being given here contains an aspect of the truth. And yet, relating those aspects of the truth in a way that produces results is exceedingly difficult. Why? Because we have accumulated historical baggage that we have to work through. In other words, there is an inhibition. There is an obvious inhibition about doing actually any of the things that are being proposed, uh, let alone all of them, because in fact, all of them would have to be done. <clears throat> Anyone else can respond? Um, oh, uh, I don't recognize the characterization of me as simply wanting to repeat the Second International. I want to repeat an element of the idea of the Second International, which is to say the line of Fable as opposed to the line of Luxembourg. Mm -hmm. Because it seems to me that the line of Luxembourg was, in fact, a piece of Bakuninism which carried with it the invisible dictatorship character of the SDKPIL in Poland, and that the far left has been repeating the pattern of the SDKPIL in Poland, which simultaneously did not build CADA and separated itself from the actual class movement. Yeah? So, <clears throat> uh, on the other hand, the, the uh, Second International, the character is that the, the majority, the Kadsky, I they, they, they believed in socialism in one country. That's clear from the airport program. Mm -hmm. And they uh, believed that you could take hold of them both and use the existing bureaucratic apparatus of the state complete with the separation of powers, etc., etc., etc. And both of those, those are the reasons and not the stuff about dialectic and not the things which the left of the SPD argued, which is why the SPD. Yes, we do. It's wrong. Okay. So then what do we do now? What do we do now? We're in a situation where the people who have forces, who have the potential to launch initiatives which could take off and could take off and like uh, big go uh, things at the moment, are launching initiatives of a sort which are more or less guaranteed to end in tears. Our policy as CPGB is to go into those initiatives and try and shift them in a direction which make them less likely to end in tears by making them more like we want to create a communist party. And we want to create an internationalist movement. That's, uh, <coughs> and that's what we can do. That's, you know, we can take that because people are, it's not the case that nobody is launching initiatives to try and create uh, broader unity or the great new party, etc. The series of initiatives, characteristically, they, 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 they're so designed that they're designed to try and avoid the question are you for taking office under capitalism, void, are you for or against taking office under capitalism, are you for or against internationalism? You want to dodge those issues because they think it poses the question of the formal revolution. We need to overcome that attempt to rerun, that's the attempt to rerun the books. Sorry, that's it. And then, you know, if you wanted to say something, Tom, I don't want to stop you. Yeah, yeah. Just keep it at that. Look, I just, look, it's like this. I mean, um, my starting point is in the US, where I've got capacity, where I hope, might hope to have some capacity to do something. We've got nothing, right? There's nothing that exists here that's at all like a left, nothing. There's nothing for us to debate about, there's nothing for us to fight over, there's nothing. And that fucking Metro New York Labor Party was <laughs> such a disgusting, reprehensible warren of, 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 of squabbling sectarians. <laughs> right? 
it, it was unbelievable. We, we had to stop them from picking the Central Labor Council, right? And we're a labor party, right? Uh, it, it's crazy, but I won't go off on that. But, but, but what did come out of our experience, well, look, I mean, we began the experience with this perspective, right? That there's talent and, uh, and sharp critiques of capitalism grounded, grounded critiques of capitalism in the American trade union. And, you know, I mean, like much of the um, intermediate levels of trade union leadership are people like us, right? It came out of the new left. Uh, and, or Maoist organizations even, and learn how to organize. And, and they have standing among actual workers in actual places who live in neighborhoods and, and have families and, and a long history of a successful um, organizing, fighting, fighting bosses, right? And, and that's where the cadre building comes from, or begins, right? Um, with, with people who have some political sense, who have some organizing talent, who've got some standing someplace. And, you know, I mean, again, like, in, in the city of Chicago, like the CTU, right, is, is like the linchpin, I think, to uh, building a, a left movement uh, in this city. Uh, for those reasons, they've got a critique, they've got standing, uh, not just with, with their own members, but, but um, elsewhere in the population, and, and uh, organizing talent. And to me, I mean, like everything else, to me, you know, we're right after our founding convention. Uh, I came back here, and like three, three weeks after uh, the founding convention, I was at uh, the Solidarity Convention on a panel with Jane Slaughter. And some guy, nice guy, well-intentioned, asked me, how do we know you, you aren't going to line what wind up like the British Labor Party, right? And I told him, you know what? If we are lucky enough to be successful enough to have that as a goddamn problem sometime, then then I think we would have been a wild success, right? But but that you know but that's his tendency, right? And it's back to what I said before: you got to crawl before you walk. You, you got to walk. Up, you got to walk before you run. And uh, and where I start out again is 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 a brute fact. I think that there is nothing of a left that counts for anything in in the U.S. So I think we've got to figure out. Yeah, I mean, party emerges out of the movement right, in some way, uh, but it's not going to create. It. And we need to get access to the class. And you know, the class is in the trade union. Okay. Um, Tom, I know you respond, but. Please try to be uh, brief so we can go to another question. Yeah, uh, but Chris says, how do you develop long-term cadres? I mean, today, you develop the same way that you developed them in the 1960s, in the 1940s, and 1920s. Um, we're just operating on a very small scale. I mean, the left is it's in terrible shape. There's no question about that. And there's not much of a pool to draw from. But when you get an intelligent and committed young person who begins to understand that the only way out is socialist revolution, and is willing to make the personal sacrifices required for that, which of course, you know, we're looking for needles and haystacks when we talk about that. But there are such people out there. Um, and we can, you can, you know, I mean, people can make that journey of Carmen from Tampa's got a group around him that managed to make that leap. I don't believe that it's impossible that there's another 200 people out there if we can, you know, uh, I mean, you know, trying to do something similar. I mean, that's all we're talking about, trying to do something similar. Then you need to get together and discuss, well, what was the Russian Revolution and where did it go wrong? And, you know, was James Weinstein right about the Socialist Party doing the great tragedy? Blah, blah, blah. There's lots of things. But assuming you get <coughs> one over who's serious and you've got a little, a smallish plot, you look for places that, in fact, if they went in and began to develop a following in the working class, so that, as I've been saying, you've got to have a long-term perspective. We're talking about tens of years. But you can go in there and get get people, and you know, there's layoffs and stuff, but if you survive that, if you get 10 or 12 years standing in the union, and, you, and you're smart, and you give good advice to the workers, you'll get a base. And you don't hide the fact you're a socialist. I mean, you keep it quiet for a long time, but you let them you let it leak up, and then you start recruiting. You know, that's that's how it's done. It's not. It's you know, it's actually not rocket science. It's not that easy, and it's harder than you think. But it's quite doable. And we still got lots of people around who've done it. You know, we'll all be dead in 20 years. But <laughs> act quickly. <laughs> Thanks, Tom. Um, Toby. 
Um, uh, okay, some more pragmatism. Um, so some of the issues that uh, my organization works on and is organized around are, um, so in Illinois, two thirds of corporations that do business in the state don't pay anything in corporate taxes to the state. Uh, we did a poll, 70% of people in the state think that corporations should pay more taxes, or at least more than zero, uh, including, and this is across uh, Democrats, Republicans, independents. Um, financial transaction tax on Wall Street and in Chicago, the South Street, um, and also uh, the city of Chicago and CPS school, the Chicago Public Schools uh, have these interest rate swap deals with financial institutions, which were almost certainly uh, negotiated fraudulently, and if they uh, attack those, then we could get hundreds of millions or even over a billion dollars back into CPS in the city of Chicago. Okay, so um, these, you know, we've pulled one of these issues, but I think overall this has broad support, and I think that overall there is a large progressive majority standing to the left, I would say, of the Republican Party and at least the mainstream of the Democratic Party. Uh, Chicago election, we got involved in this and supported uh, Trey Garcia. Uh, he took up some of these issues. Uh, I think they could have been emphasized more. Um, so, I think I wrap it up. Uh, so I happen to uh, agree with uh, Alfred that it's premature to talk about a party for the left, but either way, but how we stand on that question, um, do you think that this is relevant for building the left? I don't think all these people are socialists in waiting, but I do think that this progressive majority points towards at least a politics that can break with neoliberalism. But, but yeah, I think it's possible. I mean, uh, I think the tough part about it is, is that um, fiscal issues are really tough to get um, people outside the universities and, and the PMC to mobilize around. You know what I mean? I mean, it's people will support the principle, and I'm not at all uh, I'm surprised about that. But like, then comes the next step, and it, and and I think that's one of the um, often under recognized um, ways that the um, or facets of the right wing victory in the mid 70s, thanks to Jimmy Carter, largely, is turning the notion of urban crisis um, you know, into fiscal crisis, which shifts the terms of debate like away from justice and, uh, and, uh, and, 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 and straightforward um, I mean, political economy and turns it into a discourse that has accountants battling each other. Uh, and I think that's, that's, that's partly what what makes it tough to mobilize around. I mean, I think it makes a lot of sense to keep hammering on it, right? And 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 you know, do the education about it. Uh, what I mean around it, but 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 and I suspect this is what you're saying. Too, or it sounds like this is what you're saying too. That it's tough to find ways to convert that into um, um, into issues that 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 can send a, a um, you know streak of passion. Right, uh, I mean, out, uh, you know, you know, out among the working class, uh, I mean, constituency. Yeah, it's a hard one, um, and it's like the campaign finance uh, memory reform stuff too. Which is why we just um, we stayed away from it. Like we adopted a plank just to make the liberal or you know that strain of the leftists feel good, but but you can't build a popular base on that kind of stuff, or, or it's not among the working class. Okay, thanks. Um, can we get one, uh, Pam? So one of the formulations that Tom reads about um, political organization was that different models of political organization fit different tasks. Um, and you know, we would say that these tasks are not only dictated by our goals, but the moment that we live in and sort of recognizing what potential is available versus what obstacles might be available today. So while I have a lot of respect for the Bolshevik party, I think that we do live in a different time, although the party might be a desirable um, future task. But what about the present task? So I think that in calling the conversation about the party premature, though, um, there is a necessity to talk about it only insofar as that there are leftist parties in power right now. And there are, there are at least attempts by people on the left to say that this is, this is an opening. And so, while well, I agree that we're not in a situation in which, in the United States at least, we could organize a successful socialist party, 
Um, the very presence of something like Syriza in its capacity to politicize people today means that we have to engage, at least in this room, the issue of what the left thinks the party is for. Um, and so just in just trying to articulate this task, I found that in Adolf Fried's comments, um, and also from a previous uh, the Black Politics panel, uh, you emphasized the absence of the left as a social force. And this panel, you talked about it as well, as having organizers specifically, people that are knocking on doors. But I also think that another task that might be in the present is an absence of a kind of radical political imagination, um, which at least in this room is what we're trying to do. Not as a replacement, you know, in order to dissuade people from being organizers, but because the death of the left is not just in its ability to you know, get people out of the streets, but because it can't really talk about socialism, like you said. So what is then the different tasks, maybe, that are needed in the present, if you could give a shot? Not just one, it seems that there are many. Um, but yes, so how do we adequately organize for the present tasks of the present? Well, I'll say this, and this is, oh, sorry. Um, it, it makes sense that we all think about Syriza and Podemos and Chavismo and uh, PT, and, but there's also a tendency that we have, right, and this is partly kind of an American thing too, to presume that what, that what we think about these um, regimes and movements uh, amounts to ill beings, you know what I mean? I mean, um, it really doesn't, right? And I guess there's an argument that could be made that, well, or rather, I should be clear. If the discussion takes the form of um, making judgments about what you know, what, what they're doing, well, in the first place, like we don't have enough information about any of those regimes and the complex characteristics of the coalitions that they're, uh, 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 that they're trying to maintain. What? Yeah, I'm not just assuming everybody in this room has or doesn't have that problem of, of the lack of imagination, because I think that's kind of one of the bonds that, that, that we all share. But that, you know, that's definitely a problem with, with the social movements, right? And what that would mean, and so among the tasks would be to um, build around them. You know what I mean? I mean, that, that you know, stuff like, uh, I mean, the identitarian movements are what, what they are. Right, uh, you know, the blogosphere is what, what it is. Right, um, the the campus movements are what what they are, and um, I think it makes sense for us to study and to you know think to uh, to um, engage in critical examination of a uh, uh, grounded critical examination of of the dynamics of American capitalism or global capitalism or what or what, what whatever else discuss vision. Um, and alternatives, I mean, um, you know, I think we need to spend a hell of a lot of time in trying to uh, identify um, what some people have called practical utopias, right? I mean, uh, um, um, objectives that in principle could be one that would, uh, given political will, right? Uh, and that would throw into relief the contradictions or would or would facilitate throwing, throwing into the relief the contradiction of capitalism, like shutting down public education, for instance, and challenging that. And not just the defensive struggle, right, but like going on the offensive and, and demanding free public higher education for everybody, right? And, and uh, it's a kind of issue, or it's you know, those issues uh, that can start conversations going out in the communities and in the workplaces and among you know, some of the young activists or whatever. Uh, which I think is consistent with your idea, or uh, with your concern, I mean, which I share um, about you know limbed vision in what uh, in activist is left. I, mean, I don't know if that's responsive. Uh, does anyone else want to Chris? I wanted to say something just about you know the conjunctural moment of this conversation, the way it was framed uh, in terms of the panel description. So, Cerisa Podemos, Dilinka. Um, I think 
one of the reasons why we didn't include the pink tide um, is because it, it, it sort of predates the economic crisis. In other words, it predates uh, 2007, 2008, and so has a different dynamic at work. Um, and so that's the only reason. It's not, it's not uh, for any other reason. Um, and in the case, and I think that Mike already mentioned this, in the case of Syriza and Podemos, what's posed is a potential replacement to the bankrupt social democratic parties. Like, uh, especially with Greece, it's very clear that um, Pesach uh, sort of ran up against the wall and that Syriza is there to essentially fill the void. Um, and, and is, in a sense, objectively constrained to fill that void very precisely. In other words, that they've had to uh, try to recruit the, the former Pesach bureaucracy as a, as a constituency. Um, and so the fact that the party question is raised in particularly this way as a crisis of European social democracy in particular, um, I think is uh, you know, sobering. In other words, that, that brings it down to earth in a particular way. And it also obviously is about neoliberalism, meaning it's about a kind of uh, late coming of neoliberalism to the continent. Uh, you know, not so much the UK, but certainly the continent in Europe. Um, and so it does raise the question of social democracy, of, uh, you know, what it means to try to reconstitute social democracy in its current bankruptcy, but long after its historic bankruptcy. And so it raises all these questions of politics and of socialism. Um, and so I just wanted to sort of put that into the mix because you know, a few short years ago, in 2008, when the 75th anniversary of the uh, New Deal was being celebrated, uh, I think there was a kind of neo-Keynesian illusion. You know, uh, I don't know if it was so much a neo-Fordist illusion, uh, because I think Toby you know, raised this yesterday about nationalism, so there are different aspects of, of Fordist Keynesianism. Um, which, to bring it all the way back around, raises the question of what we mean by capitalism. And I think that was already commented on, the slippage between neoliberalism and capitalism. In other words, that we can't really use one term to substitute for the other. Um, and so, uh, you know, why Marxism might be important, why the history of Marxism might be important, why the history of Marxist political parties might be important, is precisely in understanding the relationship between capitalism and socialism. In other words, that's where People don't know what socialism means. Um, they don't understand the way Marxists once understood, and in a very practical way understood. In other words, that Lenin and Luxembourg welcomed the industrialization of the Russian Empire in the 1890s and wrote dissertations on it and said, you know, this is this is the way to socialism, rather than a neurotic, peasant-based socialism that would avoid capitalism. I think that that question does come up: What would we mean by socialism? What do we mean by capitalism? We complain about capitalism, but what do we really mean by that, actually? Um, and that that would be you know, the, the only point in trying to rescue some heritage of Marxism. I'll just add think? that point that Chris has just made. He, I think it, there's a problem with regarding the phenomena of the European we quote the European left as being a post-crisis phenomenon, apart from mm. whatever. Mm. Because Syriza you know, has been around. It's, history, yeah. uh, it's basically the KKE, the Greek Communist Party interior, with the various bits of the far left mm. attached to it. Yes. And to a considerable extent, what's involved in all of these, almost all of these, uh, you know, parties is the recovery of nerve by forces which have come from the old communist, official communist tradition. You know, after a period of complete loss of nerve, a loss of morale in the immediate aftermath of uh, the uh, uh, fall of the regimes in 1991. Yeah. Aren't they Euro communists? So, 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 so these are Euro communists. Uh, uh, on the other hand, the uh, PCF, the Front de Gauche in France, um, uh, the PCF was a non-Eurocommunist wing of uh, 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 that. Uh, Refondazioni blew themselves up by participating in government and they be dead now, but at their height were a big deal. Yeah, so th and this is all 
This is a phenomenon which started in the 90s and has gone on through the 2000s. And yes, um, Podemos is the odd one because in a certain sense it might be regarded as being a sort of um, the Mandalites combining with public relations experts to uh, <laughs> divert the growth of uh, the Esquerda Unida that the United Left. Yeah. Uh, okay. There's a hand with uh, a couple of hands out there. And all the way in the back. So, Chris, your remarks seem to suggest that you see the formation of a socialist party in the United States as plausible in the near to medium term future. And of course, I think the risk that Adolf seems to be pointing towards, that is, it must be obvious to you, is that such a formation would become just another Marxist grouplet with a paper program or even an internet program more likely. Um, clearly this is something you've thought through, so I'm wondering what would have to happen? What would that formation have to do? How would it have to be for something different or other than already exists on the left to kind of uh, uh, overcome that, that risk um, in order for that risk not to be an obstacle that you know, should forbid or prevent any such attempt, but rather a, an obstacle to be recognized and overcome. What, what would it take to actually overcome it? And then I'd be curious to hear um, from Adolf and perhaps others how, how you see the adequacy of, of Chris's response to that question. <laughs> I'll just say this negatively, um, meaning that, uh, so I mentioned, you know, uh, being demoralized by the election of Bill Clinton. Right, formative experience for me. Um, in other words, uh, when I look at, you know, young people today, millennial Marxism or Marxishism or whatever you call it, um, whatever Benjamin Munkel and, and uh, Bhaskar have called it, um, you know, and I say, is this neurasthenics for the Democrats? Meaning, you know, is it just going to be some elaborate rationale for ultimately voting for the Democrats? And it seems like it could be something else. However, it, it doesn't seem to be spontaneously tending in that direction. And another thing that I'd say, um, which is unfortunate that they can't be here to speak for themselves, but I'm also, I find it loss of nerve over at Jacobin uh, Magazine headquarters with respect to their simple republication of many ISO socialist workers articles. Meaning that it's, it, you know, the, the Bhaskar started out trying to uh, overcome the, the difference between the DSA and the ISO, and instead he's just uh, consummating with the ISO uh, in a way that's rather unfortunate. And I know that Bhaskar has platypus on his mind when he says things like they, they're not a pre political project, but they're a political project because they want to be engaged with the activists. Parentheses, the ISO. Meaning, um, and again, you know, is there an alternative to that? And so that's why I define it negatively. It seems to me that we are in a potential period of being disencumbered of a lot of the terrors of previous generations of the left, including the new left, while at the same time we can still learn from the generation of the new left. In other words, um, you know, because they tried to do something that starting in the 80s, people haven't even tried to do. And that gets back to Tom Riley, to the, the point about um, you know, small groups of people can do something. Sure, um, but we haven't seen that, right? What we've seen is a kind of institutionalization of the death of the left since the 80s. Uh, academic left and an activist left, um, a modus vivendi uh, between the two. Um, and uh, it's really been entrenched, meaning, uh, you know, both, I would say, both academic leftism and activist leftism are what Adorno called pseudo-activity, and he was kind of far-sighted. He saw that the new left was heading in that direction. And yet, between Adorno's time and when it actually took place, in the 70s, something else kind of went on. And I don't know whether we can make use of the organizational experience of that generation. The, the kind of lost generation, the generation nobody likes to talk about, the 70s experience. Um, but, you know, the, the danger is in naturalizing what has taken place since then, 
namely academicism and activism, and post-political, you know, kind of anarch neo-anarchism uh, that you saw with the anti-globalization movement. Um, and so that's why I define it through a series of negations, if you will, or a series of, you know, is that all that there is, my friend? <laughs> so, uh, respondents? <laughs> well, I, mean, I would just add um, um, to uh, you know, the litany about, um, about, about uh, the most fun of Bhaskar's operation that, um, you know, the play anarchists and the real anarchists and libertarians and the posers and, mm -hmm. and the Brooklyn Coffee House left. But, um, <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, what can I say? I mean, um, I think that a problem with contemporary with, with contemporary leftists, right, in, in the absence again of, the, of any sort of institutional traction, is the tendency, maybe exacerbated by the blogosphere and 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 its uh, material pressures, um, a tendency like to disconnect the idea of being on the left and even being an activist from, from base building, right? From trying to broaden the base, right? Uh, I mean, I saw at Treasure Island, like in Hyde Park a couple of years, a few years ago, a very earnest young woman going into uh, the supermarket with, with a tote bag that had on it what I later learned was a quote from John Kennedy, uh, um, any one person can make a difference and that everyone should try. Uh, and I went home and I immediately added the first signature to my email account that I've ever had, which was, yet what force on earth is weaker than the uh, feeble strength of one? Um, and there's that problem, right? And so, you know, and that's, and, 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 and I think, again, I mean, um, you know, the New York Metro Labor Party chapter is a perfect, perfect illustration of the problem that we're here to in every big city, that being on the left or seeing oneself as a leftist has come to substitute for doing the, you know, exactly the kind of cadre building of what, I mean, political work that Tom was talking about and that I've been talking about. And, so what that means then is, I think it's a mistake, actually, to look um, in uh, among the world of the Jacobin readership mm. to and people like that, like to find new recruits. I think it makes a lot more sense to go into machine shops or into other union locals, right? And if you want to find your so-called millennials there and. Uh, and I'd like to remind us that, you know, I mean, those are advertising categories, all those things. Um, not, not organic groups, right? Um, that it's, you know, I just think it's better to bypass the left, right? Because, uh, uh, I mean, even from the project of, of creating socialists, um, you know, go into the working class, right? And work with people in, in the working class. And, you know, I'm, I'm insofar as, Leftism has become an identity. Mm. It actually gets in the way of building the kind of politics that I think everybody in this room wants to build. And that's the fundamental reason that I say that, that the party building, that it's premature to talk about party building. And it's gotta come, the working class party has to be anchored somehow in the institutions of the working class, right? Uh, uh, I, I mean, it seems like a silly truism. Right. Um, one of the differences between earlier eras is that people like like us um, could connect ourselves to the institutions of the working class and become in, in, embedded in them. Um, now, people like that don't so much want to be. And then there's also the problem of what I've taken lately that you're calling. Um, you know, Ivy League techno syndicalist trade unionism, right? And that's another problem we have to deal with. Uh, Tom, do you have a response? Okay. Just a oh, small Mike. add that I guess is to some extent that's a uh, view from the side of the Atlantic. Mm, yeah. Right. No, absolutely. Uh, simply because you know, um, 
and I have my have my problem with it is which may be just because it's a view from the other side of the Atlantic, that everybody on the left in Britain would tend to say, forget the rest of the left, it's a bunch of sectarians slash or better school trust slash, etc. Go out to the working class. You go out to the estates, mm -hmm. and who do you find there? The factories. Right. The rest of the left. Right. Yeah. Right. It ain't the case. Yeah. The, right. There is it's true there's a Identity, identity politics of a, of a, of a very <coughs> dead end character, but actually, where that identity politics of a very dead end character has powerful basis is in uh, 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 the trade union. Mm. Yeah. Since uh, the seventies, yeah. Since well, not since the seventies in England, but since the eighties, oh, really? since the eight, late eighties, so after the defeat of the mine strike. Um, right, but, of course. Um, yeah. <laughs> But, but it's the, the, the problem, you know, you go out there, even you go out there with uh, somewhere where there seems to be none of the rest of the far left, you're going to find a damn Labour Party. Labour Party <laughs> activists who turn out to be a whole lot more left wing than their leech. You know, so it's a sort of, I think that's, that's, what, yeah. that's actually half what you're right if you were to go from England to continental Europe. Right. Yeah. Uh, so that then it's, it's not a question of, um, that maybe it's a peculiarly US problem that you're, mm -hmm. the, 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 you, the, the, the conditions for creating the party don't exist. Because there, it's not that conditions for creating the party don't exist. There are loads of parties which are real. But real forces are capable of doing things like Tom talked about. But where's it going? It's not going in a direction which is actually the creating any leverage against the capitalist. Yeah, and I mean, here they become solipsistic enterprises, right? Um, and it's getting away. Basically. Okay, um, I'm going to say we have about five minutes left. It's 9.21. We ran uh, a bit over, but I think we can have one last brief question. Um, Nick? <coughs> Okay, so I would like to ask a question about electoral politics and trade unions. And going back to the example that was alluded to before with Chicago's most recent election uh, with Julie Garcia. Um, because here, you know, in the absence of grounds for the Socialist Party, we have the unions funneling money into surrogate pseudo political organizations. I say pseudo, you know, not to be you know, antagonistic, but I mean, they don't really have the political feel to them. They're about, you know, warm and fuzzy, like working families, right. uh, type of things, right? right. Um, so we have people who are interested in politics, who want political experience, um, and in the absence of some kind of organization to collect this experience, to create some kind of collective history, collective experience, collective knowledge going forward, Instead, we have people being turned into canvassers, uh, you know, with the latest talking points on the tax statistics and whatever, whatever the budget numbers turn out to be. Um, and they're going out canvassing door to door for Pat Quinn with a mustache. And <laughs> unsurprisingly, he got beat even worse uh, than he did in the first time. You know, he got his ass kicked. Um, so I guess my question is, you know, if we if it's now is not the time for some kind of organization to, I guess, have some kind of, you know, collective transfer of experience. How do we interact with trade unions? How do we interact with their political efforts? Um, and you know, do we, you know, how do we how do we deal with this phenomenon where we have to interact with the state political? These elections happen every four years or however many years. Um, you know, do we just liquidate and go into these surrogate organizations? I, I presume you're familiar with Sam Ginn because you're on the Socialist Register. Right. You know, do we try and form these, you know, more left sounding euphemistic organizations where you know we don't come out as socialist, but we try and do some kind of mediation between trade unions and electoral politics. Um, so I mean that's what I'm kind of curious to hear. You know, particularly from Chris, because he hasn't come out necessarily for a socialist party. Um, you know, and then some of the other panelists, which are identified with socialist parties that 
have active trade union interest. Um, from Chris down. Okay. Um, right, so I would say that, you know, in terms of the danger of putting the cart before the horse, uh, whether it's a cart or a horse, it needs to be something. Uh, meaning I would make the argument that um, you do need form to have substance, actually. Uh, in the sense that uh, the experience is happening, but it's not being accumulated. Um, now, uh, so I would sort of push back on the issue of movementism, because I think that that is something that we inherit from the new left, but also from the old left. We, we inherited from the 1930s. And I do think that uh, the popular front phenomenon uh, contributes to that, to the idea of movement. Um, and so I do think that, you know, movement constituting politics, uh, that there could be also the reverse, that politics could constitute movement. And, uh, you know, I don't know, uh, the SPD experience in, in late um, 19th century Germany was uh, that the party built the unions. In other words, the unions didn't build the party. Party built the unions, um, and the British experience of the Labour Party is is uh, more complicated, I would say, also than uh, simply the unions building the party. Uh, even though it looks very much like it's a party that rests on the Trade Union Congress, I think that the history is still a little more complicated. Uh, you know, an old Trotskyist uh, truism is that the Reds built the unions. Um, and so the question is, uh, what does it take to be a red? Um, and that does, I think, involve some framework for accumulating experience and accumulating uh, organizational practice. Um, and so that's why I would still say that uh, you know, the idea of political party formation is not necessarily putting the cart before the horse. Uh, because people are going to be active, they are going to be struggling, and it is going to be some default Democratic Party phenomenon, which I think is deadly. Um, and, you know, again, I would reiterate something from my opening remarks, which is that the last major political crisis in the United States was a crisis of the Democratic Party. It was a crisis of the New Deal coalition in the 60s. Um, and that we can learn, again, negatively from that. Uh, that uh, you know, we can't look forward to another crisis of the Democratic Party because the Democratic Party today is not what it was. Uh, in other words, it already was transformed in that crisis uh, into something else. Um, and so uh, that affects the way we inherit the legacy of the New Deal coalition from the 30s to the 60s and the implicit models that the left lives with from that experience. Um, uh, it, it's difficult for me to respond to this because it's actually um, American, it's a very specific, I think a pretty specific American political issue. You know? My general view though is as a matter of uh, tactics, if people are <clears throat> mobilizing from the trade unions for some attempt at political intervention, then be there even in spite of the fact that what they're doing is desperately unprincipled, uh, is pro-democrat party, etc., etc., and try and push back at that boundary. Mm -hmm. As far as the history, it's true to think about the British Labour Party. The British Labour Party was not, is not, it is the creature of one of the unions, particularly a few of the unions, not the whole of the TUC. But it was created in reality by two-stage process. And the first stage in that process was that the small left groups, the ILP with about 10,000 members, the SDF with about seven or 8,000 members, started to fight and win local election campaigns. And the circumstance in which the left groups were beginning to start to fight and win local election campaigns created a climate in which uh, it was possible to win the trade unions first to backing the local election campaigns of the socialist groups and then to win the trade unions at national level with the creation of an independent labor party. That's how it happened. Yeah. So it's not straightforwardly just as it's put in the history, the standard history books say, the Labour Party, the TAF failed judgment led the trade unions to well, back the go, go turn to the Labour Party. 
that's an incomplete story. And it does seem to me that whenever people try and say build a Labour Party based on the trade unions, they're actually not understanding the British Labour Party or the extent to which the British Labour Party is the creature of the affiliated socialist societies right the way down to 1918, which is when the constituency Labour Party institutions were set up and created. Uh, you know? Yeah, yeah, I'll just say this. I mean, uh, well, and the first thing I'm going to say is that I, I, I've got a somewhat less jaundiced view about Chuy Garcia, uh, though he is, you know, yes, uh, a liberal Democrat. But, um, you know, there's a tendency to fetishize um, electoral action uh, that, that, that ironically meets in the middle from two directions, right? I mean, like the Democrats say, that's all there is, that's all there can hope to be ever. And then there's a sort of principled left position that says, oh God, you can't ever engage in this, that this is like the sellout, you've got to, God forbid, try to figure out how to form alliances with people who don't agree with you about stuff. <laughs> um, and they both kind of wind up at the same place. I mean, I made a reference in an essay I wrote about this to a really horrible movie from the, um, from, from the late 70s. But, so in that sense, yeah, I mean, Sometimes you just have to do stuff like that. And it made perfect sense, given where things were, um, especially after the 2012 strike, um, especially after Rauner gets elected. It makes perfect sense to, to challenge Rom. It made more sense to challenge Rom when it would have been Karen. Although, you know, I recall reading like in Jack, but in Elsewhere, people denounced her right, even before she had a chance to declare. Um, but, you know, I mean, like, you don't always win, right? And, there, uh, and what we, can, what we need to analyze, and people are, um, you know, what happened, why, why, why the election turned out the way it did, and, and I mean, what we can learn from it, and, and how those lessons can help us move, move forward, like the movement building project, and I mean, the organizing project, because why it is kept, you know, Jindal, Walker, Rauner, uh, and who else am I missing, right? I mean, these guys are out to destroy every bit of social protection that working people in this country have won since the 1920s. And sometimes, you know, like a popular front approach, I mean, I, uh, well, uh, um, frankly, I think that demeans the popular front at this point. But that kind of approach is necessary to to fight back against this stuff and to create a little bit of space. And yes, there's always a danger, right, uh, in, in, in uh, trying to build a kind of alliance that you need to create the space that will get outflanked. The book I've been trying to finish is basically that story about the post-war left. But, you know, I mean, you don't have much control over what happens after you put the ball in play. But you gotta put the ball in play and then Try to make the most out of it. And the last words to Well, you know, uh, the Democratic Party is the graveyard of the left in America. It's, it's crippled. Um, the entire left, it's, uh, the terms of the popular front is in the 30s was um, the beginning of the end for the Communist Party. The Communist Party, uh, by adapting to the American bourgeoisie through its Democratic Party face, uh, liquidated most of the political capital they acquired through providing the shock troops to build the CIO in the first place. You know, predominantly, lots of other black groups contributed. Um, there are no strike pledge activity in World War II. Soften them up for the McCarthy purge, which then drove all the Reds out. I mean, it became very unpopular. And Unfortunately, the American working class was not sophisticated enough to distinguish between a good Trotskyist and a bad communist. They didn't care what kind of communist you were. Um, and that weakened the American working class immensely. Um, the, there was a resurgence of sorts in the 60s uh, with the New Left, but the New Left was crippled by a lack of historical understanding. The New Left imagined that it was all new and that we could do everything you know, and we wanted to be original, and we wanted to do, et cetera, et cetera. Eventually, um, 
experience taught a certain layer of the new left that actually there had been more to the old left than we thought, and it was necessary to make a turn to the working class and seek to inject some social politics in the working class. Uh, they were the best of the new left, and there were thousands of them who were serious and committed people who went in factories. Um, you know, few remain. There's, there is, there are some of them. Uh, but the role of the Democratic Party was extremely important in corralling and uh, liquidating the mass base. You know, there have been a hundred, a few hundred thousand people probably involved in the more or less new left at some point. And, the, the critical moment in its destruction was the McGovern campaign, where we get the far left of the, of the Democratic Party, the George McGovern, who really, really hated the war, and was practically almost sort of a socialist, I guess, like this Chuy Garcia guy, who's practically a socialist, although he wants to hire 100,000 more cops. He's almost a socialist. He's the best we can hope for, and we have to make historic concessions to him, even though he wants to cut workers' pensions. But still, you know, the other guy's even worse, so therefore, you know, with that kind of thinking, we can only be defeated. And, you know, it is necessary to make uh, headway towards smashing capitalism. People have to be prepared for a difficult struggle, and we can't just always choose be sought the easiest path, the, the path that seems to be most um, path of least resistance. I mean, you can be extremely thirsty out in a boat in the sea. You can get thirsty to the point where you decide that you're gonna have a, just a little bit of salt water. You know it's not good for you, but you're so thirsty, and this is a genuine emergency, so I'm going to vote for Chuy Garcia, or I'm going to have a glass of salt water, but guess what? It doesn't make it better, it makes it worse. It makes you weaker. And then you have to have another glass of salt water. And before long, um, you're probably dead sooner than you would be if you waited to see if your boat would drift into shore or maybe you could get out and get some real water. So, um, I mean, you know, that's uh, a cute analogy. But that's not the fucking thing in the world to do. But, but My thing is don't, don't vote for people who want to hire more cops and cut pensions because the other guy's even worse. But that's, you know, that Trotskyism for you. Sure is. <laughs> and there's nothing wrong with Trotskyism that can't be cured. <laughs> well, on that note. <laughs>